Dr. Sage here. Now, when one typically thinks about microbiology, they typically think about the prokaryotes, so that'd be the bacteria and the archaea. However, there are some eukaryotes that are involved in the study of microbiology. So, I'm gonna begin by giving you a brief introduction to the history of eukaryotes. By the end of this video, you should be able to relate bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic cells to the last common ancestor, and list the types of eukaryotic microorganisms and denote which are unicellular and which are multicellular. The first eukaryotic cells appeared on the earth two to three billion years ago. Bacteria and eukaryotes evolved from a precursor called the last common ancestor. The last common ancestor was neither prokaryotic or eukaryotic, and it gave rise to bacteria, archaea, and eukarya separately. Now, when one thinks about the phylogenetic tree of life, we often think about this tree here. However, this tree would be a little bit more realistic to denote the tree of life. Why? Well, for one reason, because of some of the organelles that eukaryotes have. Some eukaryotic organelles originated from more primitive cells that became trapped inside eukaryotic cells. So, for example, inside eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells have a mitochondria, and a lot of eukaryotic cells have chloroplasts. Well, those two organelles were originally a different living organism, like a prokaryotic cell. What this means is that genes are moving horizontally between different species. In this example, from bacteria to eukaryotes for the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. And this happens through something called the theory of endosymbiosis. Far back in evolutionary history, there was a pre-eukaryotic cell. That pre-eukaryotic cell started to have its plasma membrane fold inwards or invaginate. You can see prokaryotic cells do that all the time. At some point, this invagination started to encompass, for example, the nucleus, and over time became the nuclear envelope to create the organelle of the nucleus. So now we have eukaryotic cells. Well, eukaryotic cells can't eat prokaryotic cells. Okay, you can see this happen all the time. What happened far back in evolutionary history, there was a bacteria cell that could do aerobic cellular respiration. The eukaryotic cell went to eat that bacteria cell, but instead of digesting it, that bacteria cell started living inside the eukaryotic cell. Now, that's called symbiosis. Again, you can see that happen all the time. This was mutually beneficial to both the bacteria and the eukaryotic cell. It was beneficial to the bacteria because the bacteria was now protected by living inside the eukaryotic cell. And it was beneficial to the eukaryotic cell because that bacteria did aerobic cellular respiration, which means it produced its ATP, and the eukaryotic cell got some of that ATP. Now, over the evolutionary time scale, that prokaryotic cell lost its individuality and became the mitochondria. Similarly, there was a bacteria that could do photosynthesis. The eukaryotic cell went to eat that prokaryotic cell. Again, over the evolutionary time scale, it lost its individuality and it became the chloroplast. Okay, so there are bacteria that can do photosynthesis. Again, we can see eukaryotic cells eat prokaryotic cells all the time. We can see them living together in symbiosis. So this is how we got these two organelles is through the theory of endosymbiosis. Now, first, that sounds kind of science fiction-y or like I'm feeding you a line of bullshit, um, but there's a lot of evidence to support this. For example, you, you're a eukaryotic organism, you have your DNA, your chromosomes, inside your nucleus, okay? That's where your chromosomes are. As humans, you have 46 chromosomes. Those chromosomes are all found inside your nucleus, okay? Except you have one chromosome somewhere else. You have one chromosome inside your mitochondria. Why? Because a mitochondria used to be a separate living organism, a prokaryotic cell that had a chromosome. Now, the chromosomes inside your nucleus, they look like eukaryotic chromosomes. Eukaryotic chromosomes are long and linear chromosomes. So you're often depicted by these X shapes that you see them represented as. That's what your chromosomes inside your nucleus look like, which makes sense because you're a eukaryote. But the one chromosome inside your mitochondria doesn't look like that. The one chromosome inside your mitochondria is small and circular, which is what prokaryotic chromosomes look like. So why would there be a prokaryotic chromosome inside a eukaryotic cell, one of your cells? Because that chromosome belonged to the prokaryote that became the mitochondria over the evolutionary time scale. Okay, more evidence. You have ribosomes. Your ribosomes are floating around inside your cytoplasm. They're stuck on the outside of your rough ER. Your ribosomes are eukaryotic ribosomes. 
Now bacteria have ribosomes. Bacteria or prokaryotic ribosomes and eukaryotic ribosomes are similar, but they're not exactly the same. You also have ribosomes somewhere else. Besides following your cytoplasm and stuck on your rough ER, you have them inside your mitochondria. Those ribosomes look like prokaryotic ribosomes. More evidence. When do you make more organelles? Like when do you make another Golgi apparatus? Well, you do that whenever the cell is ready to divide to become two cells from that one cell. So that's when you make all of your organelles during cell division, except for your mitochondria. Your mitochondria divide whenever in the hell they want. Why? Because there used to be a separate living organism, a prokaryotic cell that would divide whenever it wanted. So that's how we got those organelles. And everything I said about the mitochondria is also true of the chloroplasts. The chloroplasts have their own chromosome. The chloroplast chromosome looks like a prokaryotic chromosome. The chloroplasts have their own ribosomes. They look like prokaryotic ribosomes. The chloroplasts divide whenever they want, not with the cell division of the cell. In this course, we're learning about microorganisms, bacteria, prokaryotes. Well, as a detail, it turns out that the mitochondria likely evolved from an aerobic alpha proteobacteria through endosymbiosis and the chloroplast likely evolved from a cyanobacteria through endosymbiosis. Now when you think about eukaryotes you typically think about the multicellular organisms things like yourself, animals, plants, mushrooms which is our type of fungi those are multicellular eukaryotes. Now there also are unicellular eukaryotes like yeast is a type of fungi that's unicellular, protists are a type of eukaryote that's unicellular. The first primitive eukaryotes were single-celled and independent. They became specialized to perform a particular function in a colony, and then complex molecular organisms evolved when cells lost the ability to survive apart from the colony, and these became tissues and organs of the multicellular organisms. Now, there are a few types of eukaryotic organisms that we tend to study in microbiology. Like in microbiology, you don't tend to study humans or plants. So what do we study in microbiology? Well, we study some eukaryotes that are always unicellular. For example, the protozoa. We study eukaryotes that could be unicellular or multicellular. That would be the fungi, like you can see an example of some fungus over here, or algae. You can see some examples of some algae over here. And we have eukaryotes we study in microbiology that are always multicellular. These are called the helminths. Even though they're multicellular and they're large enough to see with your eye, at least the adult versions, the reason we study the microbiology is because they have unicellular egg or larval forms. All right, well, that was your brief introduction to the history of eukaryotes as we study it in microbiology. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.